right? Hey, go ahead and grab your Bible. Uh, if you would, turn to Exodus 3. I'm going to ask the question as you get there. Hey, what's in a name? This was Shakespeare's question. Of course, it was Juliet through Romeo. What's in a name? And then she went on to say, you might know the famous line, uh, a rose by any other name smells just as sweet, essentially. What she was saying was, it's not so much the name, in his case, his name or last name, uh, group or, or tribe or whatever. It's not so much in the name, but in the essence of the thing, uh, the essence of the person, right? What's in a name? I wonder if you know what your name means. How many of y'all here in the room, I'm just curious, know what your name means? Like your first name. Okay, some of you at home, your name. I know for me, um, Jeffrey um, is my full name, Jeffrey, and it means God's peace, which is kind of cool, uh, really cool, actually. I don't know if my parents knew that when they named, like when we name kids, it's more often what's a popular name or a cool name, that's a great name. But I, I, I trust that we kind of look, what does it really mean, right? Because names matter, okay? But really, the essence of the thing, this name or the person is what matters. Uh, some years, a couple years ago, actually, um, I did a, a calligraphy thing for my, each member of my immediate family where I took their, their name, okay, all their full names and what each name meant. And then I put a, a sentence, kind of a fatherly blessing that I wrote to each one, framed it and gave it to them. I think it was for Christmas a couple of years ago. And, um, and I was so surprised at how their names actually matched up with who they really are. And they may think, well, that's kind of coincidental. None of my parents really thought that, but it was really something. I mean, Jeffrey, God's peace. So I'm kind of by nature, um, a peacemaker, a, a mediator, okay? I do a lot of that in, in leadership. Um, I'm a middle son. Uh, my middle name, Lee, is my mom's maiden name. And uh, that means, it means field or protected place, area. And then Warren, you might know. That's like, anybody know? It's like a rabbit hole, okay? Is what that is. It's like a safe a uh, haven is what it is. And, and so each, but anyway, each of my family members, I did this and just kind of blessed them. But think about names of people in your life. Like when I think of Stacy, see, there's a name. Now for you, that, that may mean something, may know other people. That's my wife, right? So immediately I'm like, I have an emotional response to that name. I know who that is because it's attached to a person, right? Names matter, but it's the essence of the person. I mean, think about this, emotional response is uh, Hitler, there's a name, right? There's a different kind of response. And now in our day, right? Trump, Biden, I mean, names bring about, they're attached to people. But here's my point. When I say God, there might be as many emotional, intellectual, spiritual interactions or reactions to God or Jesus as there are people in the room. Think about going around the world and, and say, who is God to you, right? all over the globe. People have different perspectives on who he is, right? And what we're gonna do today and in the weeks to come, we're gonna look at God and who he really is. A kind of theological deconstruction in our own minds and hearts and kind of a reconstruction of who God really is according to scripture. Because my premise is this, we have gotten off base and I'm not certain that we know who we are worshiping. And it's revealed in our lives. It was A.W. Tozer, the famous quote we've referenced often, who said, what comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. I agree with this wholeheartedly. Every one of us are theologians. Every one of us respond to God in some way because of the beliefs we have. Even atheists, right? I was talking to an atheist not so long ago. He was angry about the God that he doesn't believe in right? Angry at the God he doesn't even believe in. Everybody has a theology and everybody has an idea of who God is. We want to help you, not only in sermons like this, but we have resources that we want to help you with. The way that we know who God is, is by being in his word, not watching our latest news feed, not checking out the latest post, hearing what everybody, every commentator who claims to be Christian is telling us about what's going on in the world, but to look at the Bible and to see who God is. And so we have a, another QR code there that's going to point you to, it's just a place on our website, point you to devotional resources. It's, it's on the main page. And I'm, I'm taking a moment here to point this out because some of us need to get into God's word. It's not too late to have a Bible reading plan throughout this, this, week, this year. 
You could go to the Bible app. You can go to um, the Bible Recap app. You can go to all kinds of links there. We have links for kids, for teenagers, for children. We've got books that you can look at. Parents, you're the number one disciple maker in the home. We've got books there that are all these links, resources, according to age groups and, and different groups within, within the church. So I want you to go there, check it out, because our team has done an incredible job to build around this sermon, around this series, because we're doing everything we can to help you. Not just listen to a sermon and bam, go on with your week, but to be seeking this God that we're worshiping every single day. Again, 2020 has been hard for all of us, but it's also been revealing. It's been revealing that Christians uh, often respond to craziness and division and challenges in our culture, just like those who don't know Jesus. And there's a, this is a problem, friends. We often live as if he's not in control. We often live as if he's not sovereign over us and our nation or our lives, as as if he's not all loving or all wise. And do we really know how to walk with him every single day? How is it that God, whether big or small in your mind, how how does he impact our lives? Solomon, arguably the, the wisest man who ever lived, he said this in Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is pure insight is what that means. Now, even as I talk about God being bigger, uh, you may may think, well, well, um, that I'm gonna make the case that our God is too small and you would be right about that. Our small God has created big problems. But what happens when maybe for you, God is too big? He can be too small, but what if he's so big? In theological terms, we talk about this in terms of transcendence or eminence. If he's transcendent, he's beyond us. And he is that, by the way, you'll see today. He's incomprehensible. He's beyond our understanding and our feeble little puny minds. He's beyond us. But if he's so far removed, I can't have a relationship with him. I don't know how he interacts with me in my daily life. If he's imminent, okay, then he's very close by. And maybe in that case, we, he becomes manageable. And that's the problem for a lot of us. He's a lot like me, right? He, he is my, he's my spiritual concierge. He's my personal go-to assistant. I saw this week, uh, within the course of just a couple of hours, I saw two people wearing a sweatshirt, said the same thing. God is dope. Okay. They reminded me years ago, you might've seen Jesus is my homeboy. I, I, I get it. Okay, he's close, right? He's imminent. There we go. I, I, like he's hip, he's cool, but isn't he more than that? Isn't he so much more than that? So which is it? Is he so small that maybe I can't trust him or is he so big? I don't know how to worship him. I, I don't know how to, to interact with him. These are questions that are real and whether you know to ask them, I think we all are asking them in different ways, either subconsciously every single day. So there's a tension that we live in. In fact, the Christian life is loaded with tension and we're going today, I wanna to, I want to talk about three tensions. Here's how I wanna set this up. Three tensions that we must live in if we're gonna worship the God of the Bible. And they're tensions, I would say, that don't need to be resolved, but they're tensions nonetheless. And we're going to find answers in the scriptures throughout this month. And we're going to find answers today in Exodus 3. So Exodus 3, you're turning there. If you have your Bible, uh, Exodus 3, 1 through 15. And we're going to look at some certain uh, tensions. Think about it, the Christian life is all about tension. Uh, living in tension, grace and obedience or sovereignty and free will, election and faith, certainty and mystery, right? The Christian life is loaded with tension. And today we're going to talk about the tension that God is, he's not restricted. He, he's not surprised and he's not nameable, but he's knowable. We're going to look at tensions within each of these. So first of all, God is not restricted. Look at Exodus 3 uh, verses 1 through 6. We find Moses here and his famous encounter with God. All right. It goes like this. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. All right. Jethro. Now those of y'all my age, that's not Jethro. Bodine, it's not the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, I think we saw some of that on, on Capitol Hill probably this week. But this is, this is the, he's the priest of Midian and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb, by the way, this is Sinai. Uh, the story of Exodus has been action-packed to this point. Of course, Moses is born. 
Um, he, he grows up, he kills a man, he's on the run, he flees Egypt, and here he's on the Mount of Sinai, and now the story slows down. If you're reading the text, now it's, okay, now it slows down, but watch what happens, verse two, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Now, you may have heard this story before, right? There's a strange thing going on. Wait, is the, is the fire burn, is the bush burning? Not burning. What's happening? It's not being consumed. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see that great sight, why the bush is not burned. So something curious is going on, something interesting. He says, I got to check this out. This is important to notice. The messenger speaking is, is for God himself, but watch this. He's not contained in the bush or by the bush or even by the flame. Look at verse four. When the Lord saw he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And then Moses said, here I am. Okay, now it says, look at this. Have you ever noticed this before? The angel of the Lord. Then it says, then the Lord saw him and then God himself speaks. Is this an angel of the Lord or is this God himself? You could say, as we read the rest of the passage, you could say it this way. This is the angel of the Lord whose name is Yahweh. So you say, wait, that's confusing. Okay, our first step into the infinitude of God. God is not restricted. We can't put our little feeble minds around him. What is happening here? God's infinite nature means he's not restricted to the, just to the arenas where we place him. The boxes we put him in. To be infinite means that God isn't just quantitatively bigger. Watch this. He's qualitatively bigger. I've said it this way. He's eternal in time and he's infinite in all of his ways. He, see, he's, he, he's, he, we, we think, well, he, he's, he's, uh, he, he's really powerful. I'm really glad God's a lot powerful, more powerful than me. He's, I mean, he is strong. I'm, I'm kind of strong, but not that strong. He's really strong. No, he's, more, he's stronger than anyone. No, 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 no. He's infinitely strong. There's nothing that can be done that he cannot do. He takes no energy to do anything. He doesn't need to replenish energy when he's accomplished something. He does everything he does effortlessly. This is the God that we worship. He, everything he does, he does perfectly and without exerting any energy at all. He's infinitely powerful. And we think, well, he's also holy. I'm glad about that. He's a lot better than I am. No, no, no. He's infinitely holy. It's why in our sinful state, his holiness would kill us if we stood before him. And it's why he's coming to Moses, not straight on, full on. It would kill him. We see in other parts of scripture, and then we also also think, well, God, you know, he's, he's smart. He's why he's a lot smarter than I am. He's, he's omniscient. He's, he's, he's all knowing. He, no, 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 he's infinitely all knowing. He knows everything. There's nothing he doesn't know. You can't show him something he hasn't already seen. You can't tell him something he doesn't already know. You can't teach him anything that he doesn't already know. He's not restricted and none of these qualities or attributes contradict any of the others. He's perfect in all of his ways, but don't miss this. Moses starts to capture some of this because he slows down. He turns aside. That's not a small thing. It says, and then when Moses turned aside, brought his attention to God. God spoke to him. And that's what I want us to, to do right now today. I want it to do in the days to come. So many of us, our minds are racing all the time. We're always thinking about something. We're always looking at our screens. We're always running. We never really stop. And I want us all to stop, take a closer look. And as a church family, all month long and throughout this year, let's stop. Let's slow down and look, turn off the screen, turn off the news, look at the word of God, look at him every day and say, Lord, show me more. Here's what Moses did. Lord, here I'm, I'm here. Here I am. And friends, every one of us right now today, would you just do that? Right? Lord, I'm right here. In fact, here in the room, maybe at home, just raise your hand. Would you do that? I mean, like, Lord, I'm, you want to find, here I am. I'm right here. Find me today, God. Find me and speak into my heart. This is my hope today that he'd, he would stop us because we are, listen, we've got a burning bush right in front of us. I don't know what yours is today, but I can tell you collectively as a nation, I think God is waking us up. He's waking up the church. 
He's refining his church. He's calling us to wait. Let's, let's stop for a minute. Let's, what is going on? What is this? And many people just want to write it off. Even yes, as a fringe group. Okay. I hope so. But there's a, there's a, what I've been talking about for a long time, what we saw emerge this week, it's a Christian nationalism, a white Christian nationalism. Let me say, that's extreme. Come on, come on. Look, we saw, okay, we saw American flags. You would expect that on Capitol Hill. We saw Trump signs. You expect that. We saw, we saw Confederate, I saw a Confederate flag in, in the Capitol building. I saw, I saw a Jesus save sign out there. You may have seen it. In the midst of the mayhem, Jesus saves. And, and I don't know, was it somebody out there trying to bring an evangelistic you know, presence? Maybe in their mind they thought they were. More likely, they thought that this thing that was happening, this is aligning with the way of Jesus. And we need to categorically call it out as God's people and say, this is not the way of Jesus. Jesus is not co-opted by any worldly powers. His kingdom is not advanced by secular strength. Again, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. We will trust in the name of the Lord, our God. And any time and every time in history, when God's people, the church, sought to align with a worldly power, we saw the advancement of God diminish, not get greater. And, and we need to understand that this perversion of democracy this week, for some, it is a perversion of Christianity. And God's glory will not be taken by any group or worldly power. And I believe when we start to think that that's the way it goes, he pulls his hand off. He's gonna accomplish his will. His church is prevailing. I just want us to be a part of his church the true church of Jesus Christ, not one that is cloaked in a religion called Christianity. Instead, that follows the way of Jesus. Your burning bush might be a recent diagnosis. Your burning bush might be something that has surprised you in your life this week or recently. Listen, it's not surprise God. He's calling you to turn to him, say, Lord, here I am, I'm right here. And God called to him then. Watch this, look at verse five. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. This was uh, very common, you might imagine. This is just an act of, you know, sign of awe and respect. And then verse six, and he said, I am the God of your father. Now he starts to qualify who he is, right? He hasn't named himself, by the way, if you know this story, not yet. Um, and the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses now hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Now he's fearful. Now he's, now he's afraid. I, I wonder when the last time you were afraid of God and his presence because he's so awesome. And you say, well, yeah, but are we really be afraid? I think we should, we're to fear God, but not be afraid. And we, this is the tension, another tension we live in. God is present in the bush. He's in the fire, but he's not restricted to it. Now he's saying he's bigger than all this. He's not contained in boxes or categories that we put him in. He, 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 he makes himself known, but he has to do it in ways that we can understand, right? So he speaks to Moses. But, but we can't take each revelation that we receive from God for granted, and we can't make it turn into a formula. That's what we do. We say, well, God, act this way. Last time, he's going to do this again. I'll pull this lever and he's probably going to do that because that's what he did. I'll push this button because I pushed it last time. And, this, and God says, no, no, you can't put me in a box. And it's why we go, I can't understand why this is happening to me. What's going on in my life? Why is it that God is, what is he doing? He's at work. A.W. Tozer put it this way. And by the way, we're quoting him a lot because our staff team, I've challenged our, our lay leaders. I want to challenge you to read the book. It's called The Knowledge of the Holy. Okay, it's one of the resources that we've, we've noted among many. But read that along with us. It's a short book, deep read, deep dive, but it's a short book, A.W. Tozer. He says this, when we try to imagine God is like, we, like when, he, when we try to imagine what he's like, we must use that which is not God as the raw material for our minds to work on. Think about this. He goes on. Hence, whatever we visualize God to be, he is not. For we have constructed our image out of what of that which is or has been made 
and that which he has made is not God. You tracking with me? This is like, wait, our creative brains, our puny little brains are trying to understand the transcendent, incomprehensible God creator who made us. He's not restricted by anything. He cannot be contained, but watch this. He is revealed. Not restrained, not restricted, but he is revealed. This is our first tension here. And I've spent more time on this one. Consider this. The only thing that you know about God is what he's chosen to reveal to you. That's all you know about him. He's infinite. You don't know anything else about him. And so he's chosen to reveal himself. He reveals himself only in ways that we can grasp. And that's what's happening here. Moses wants to, here in a moment, he wants to know his name. Why? Because we, he's kind of like us. You have a name, right? I got a name, you got a name. And so we think he's a lot like us. He's speaking to him in a voice. Okay, so I get that. But this is what makes the incarnation so incredible. And why we celebrate it as believers, not just at Christmas time, but every day. Because Christ has come to us. This is why it's so amazing. He, he the infinite Son of God restricts himself to a body and he comes to us. Seeing Jesus is to see God face to face. It's to talk to him. It's to see him. But he reveals himself to a limited, restricted, temporal creation. But he is not restricted. But he is revealed. Look at this second point I want you to see. God is not surprised, right? He knows everything. We've kind of alluded to that. Look at verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And look at this. I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, the termites. I mean, it goes on, all of them. And God knows all that is happening in every corner of the world. That's the point. He already knows what's happening. He's telling Moses what's up. He is on, watch this. He knows what's happening on every spot on the planet right now. He's on the backside of Jupiter. He can see the center of the star that is billions of light years away from here right now. He looks at the molecular point within your life. He can see every single thing. He's watching a cub being born somewhere up in the Rocky Mountains right now uh, in a bear den somewhere. The Bible says in Job, he brings rain to places where nobody lives. He has flowers growing that no human will ever see. He is everywhere all the time. He's not surprised by anything in your life. He's already seen our tomorrows just as clear as he's seen our yesterdays. He's outside of time and he lives in the eternal now. God appears at the beginning of time and the end of time simultaneously. What took place this week did not surprise him on Capitol Hill or in your life. Nothing surprises him. He's in control of all things. Friends, do we know who we're worshiping? Do we know who's in control of our lives? Do you know in whom you trust? Or do you? Is it why we don't worship him? Is it why we don't trust him with our lives? He's calling us to say, I've got you. I'm aware. I know everything going on. That's what he's telling Moses here. He's not surprised. Look at verse nine. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my children, the children of Israel out of Egypt. This is the first place, I love this, where the Israelites are called my people. And look at what he's saying. These are my children. God is already at work. He's telling Moses, not only do I know what's up, not only am I knowledgeable, I'm capable. Friend, listen. He not only knows exactly what's going on in your life, he's already at work. Somebody needs to say it right now. Let's just say it out loud. He's already at work. Say it to somebody next to you. Maybe you're at home. He's already at work. He's ahead of me. He knows what I'm dealing with. Whatever I face tomorrow, he's already been there. He's already at work. Friends, this is the God that we worship. 
He's not surprised. He knows and he doesn't ignore. He knows and he acts. He's going to, and he tells Moses, I'm going to bring a host of miracles to you. I'm going to do all of this and, and you're going to see it happen. You're going to come back here and, and you're going to see I'm already in charge. So look at this. He's not surprised, but he is sympathetic. He's compassionate, supportive, empathetic. He's knowing and he's loving. This is why, again, the incarnation is so amazing. Because Jesus saw us. He saw you drowning in your sin. He saw me drowning, dying. He, was, he, didn't, like he didn't know what was happening. He saw you at your darkest point. In that darkest moment of your life, and some of you may be walking through that right now, he sees you, and he's already at work. You don't have to tell him. But he says, but come to me, bring everything to me right now. He's not restricted in your life, but he's revealed. He's not surprised, but he's sympathetic. And then finally, look at this. God is not nameable. This one might surprise you, and where I'm heading, but, he, but he's knowable. You can't put a label on him. Look at verse 13. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, well, what's his name? What shall I say to them? Now, now think about this in context. Every ancient God had a name, right? And again, because he's a lot like us, all these gods, they're made, man-made gods. You, you got a God, you give him a name. This so beautifully illustrates though and shows the infinitude of God on display. He can't be captured as a God and he can't be captured by our concepts of God. He, he's not a God, but he does speak now. And no wonder Moses, like I hear a human voice. He's speaking in my language, I understand him. So what is your name? Now watch what he does. God, you, you could, if you know this story, you're gonna always about to give him his name. Not really. He doesn't give him a name. He gives him really describing his essence. Look at verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, a lot of us have read that before. This is the word Yahweh, right, in the Hebrew. I am who I am. And if you've ever read that and gone, that's a weird name. Yeah, because it's weird. Because it's not a name. Not really. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers. Here he goes again. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, oh, I, this is who I am. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Here's what he's saying. Again, this is, he gives him a name, but not really. He's saying, I exist, but I exist in a way that only I can understand. And in a way that a title or a name could not adequately capture. So he's given him a name, but not really a name. He's nameable or he's knowable, not nameable, but he's knowable. Okay. He's not nameable, but he's knowable. See, names and titles constrain us, right? They restrict us. Like you go, well, there's Jeff. And, you know, you get to know me. It's like, this is all I got. This is Jeff. This is me. Uh, this is it right here. I got nothing more. Sorry. This is me. God says, you can't confine me. I will not be restricted even by a name. And I love this. Look at this. You don't name me. I name myself is what God is saying. We don't define him. He defines himself. He is self-defined. How about this? I flip it around this way. He defines us. We're defined in light of him. He is self-defined. He defines us. We all have our own gods that we've created. And God is saying, you can't create me. I've created you. You can't put me in a box. Friends, listen, if we were able to see God for who he is right now, this struck me, like Moses or like people in the Bible, if we were truly to see him face to face right now, I mean for who he really is, and I'm doing my darn best with my simple little puny mind in the English language. If we could capture him for who he is, I am certain that we would fall on our knees before him or we would stand before him in awe and we would give him our lives. We would never be the same again. We'd be done with all of our trivial pursuits. We'd be finished with all of our lame excuses and all of our worries and anxieties and we would give him our lives completely. And this is my great hope because this is what he desires for us today. God is not restricted, but he's revealed. He is not surprised, but he is sympathetic. And he's not nameable, but he is knowable. And the way that we know him primarily is through Christ himself, right? Tozer said it this way, in Christ, God affects complete self-disclosure. So when he did choose a name, 
He chose the name Jesus, Yeshua, which means God saves, which points to his mission. Again, his very essence of what he's about. He's the primary missionary. He comes to us. He comes to us in, in full revelation. And so every point that I've made today, Jesus takes, the, takes it even further. He's more than sympathetic. He's empathetic. He's come into our suffering. He comes from all the way to all the way from the very top, all the way down, disrobing himself and his righteousness and his holiness all the way down to where we are so that we could relate to him. And not only could we relate to him, but he would live the perfect life for us because we couldn't. He'd be the bridge to this holy God. Then he would die on the cross for our sin, take on our punishment as we stand sinful before a holy God. Jesus takes on the punishment. He dies on the cross. He's buried and he's raised again, proving that he's God in the flesh. Death and hell can't overcome him. And and, and so he then opens the door for us to enter into this relationship before this holy God. So that in Acts 4.12, it says, there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Only Jesus Christ alone. Christ alone saves. There is no other person, no other way for us to be saved. And then it says in Philippians 2, 9 and 11, it says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the father. Somebody said, amen. Praise be to God. He even says, maybe you know that passage. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. What's he saying there? He's not restricted. Look, look, he didn't, he he decided to take on limitation. He didn't push against the restrictions. He became God almighty, son of God. Jesus becomes a man and he then enters into our lives and he comes to us to say, hey, I will choose eminence over transcendence. I'll make myself known. And you can receive me and have a relationship with me. He did not reject the limitation. Praise be to God. He's come to us. He found a way. He made a way. So friends, will you turn aside? And right now, before we wrap up our time, I want to enter into a time of prayer. And then we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. There's no better way to focus on him. But before we do, if you're not right with him, if you've not received his grace, I want you to do that right now. So I want us to just bow our heads and close our eyes. And I know that uh, maybe here in the room, corporately together, worshiping the Lord, it might be a little easier, but maybe at home for you all, if you're with others, just to bow your head and close your eyes right now, to focus your heart on him. Will you pursue him every single day? Friends, do you know who you worship? Will you stay in his word? Will you be among his people? And if you've not received his grace, you do it now. Some of us are relying on somebody else's revelation. God is speaking to you right now. And he's saying, receive me by faith. Not by works, because you've got nothing to bring to the table. And friend, remember this. Belief precedes understanding. Faith precedes reason. Faith even precedes greater and greater revelation. Come to him, say, Lord, here I am. I surrender my life to you. Say yes to him right now. And here's the beauty. He will give you a new name. He will give you a name. We don't name him. He names us. You become a child of God. Receive his gift right now. Lord, come into my heart. Friend, you you become a son or daughter of the most high God. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. We take on your name. Thank you for welcoming us into your family. Lord, we love you. And we give you our lives. It's the only right, logical, spiritual response. We give you our lives today in Jesus' name. Amen.